So yeah, this talk can go uh, kind of many, many different ways depending on the crowd. So, um, so before I kind of get kicked off, I want to get an idea of who I'm talking to. So, so who here contributes to open source? Oh, good. About, about probably a third. Awesome. Um, so this talk is uh, called Open Source Every Day. I lied to you. I'm so sorry. Um, and. First of all, thanks Nick for inviting me back to speak. I promise not to swear so fucking much this time. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this talk is uh, called Open Source Every Day. It's something, uh, something I really care about. Uh, it's something I've been doing for quite a long time now. And it's uh, really kind of about three things. Uh, it's talking about, you know, a bit about what open source is, um, why it's really good to do. Um, I've been doing it every day. I want to kind of talk about, what, um, about why I'm doing that and uh, a little bit about kind of my approach to personal development. So it's all about me, basically. Um, <laughs> so hopefully, this technology will work. Yeah, it works. It's just a bit slow. Um, so what is open source? Just to kind of lay the ground. That's, uh, so open source is software in which the original source code is made freely available and may be redistributed and modified. Um, so I think a lot of people kind of get confused between open source and public source. So I kind of want to clarify this to begin with, because uh, public code isn't open source. Atom, the editor, was originally going to be uh, public code so anybody could see it, but they couldn't really do anything with it. They couldn't contribute back. And um, if you're a user of CodePen or JSFiddle, uh, you might kind of be surprised to see that the code that comes out on, uh, on JS Fiddle isn't open source. Uh, you can't just go and use that. Because unless you attach a license to it, um, you're not really free to use it. Um, whereas everything on CodePen, they force you through their terms for it to be MIT license. So open source isn't necessarily source code that you can just access freely. It's more that you've been given permission to. And this is why it's really important uh, to license your code. It's a really good license is MIT, but uh, if you don't license your code, you end up with this. It's really, really quite restrictive. Um, you can't distribute it, you can't modify it, and you can't sub-license it. Um, whereas if you MIT license your code, it's pretty much do anything you want, but don't sue. Um, so really, really important if you want people to use the stuff that build, license your code. And open source uh, is everywhere. I mean, this really goes without saying. Um, this talk, the font I'm using is Open Sans, an open source font, uh, is presented on, this is, this is rubbish, um, it's presented on Re Reveal.js, um, which is an open source uh, presentation framework. Uh, it's presented in the Chromium browser, and uh, if you want these slides later, they're on my website, which is also open source. So um, open source really is everywhere, and you can't get away with it, uh, away from it, even if you try it, because you're building on these monolithic things. This is like the OS layer, and it's like imagine having to write that for every single website you do. I don't know. And um, it's really important. It's really valuable to have um, because we get to build upon these kind of foundations uh, to allow us to focus on the bits of our applications that are actually important rather than kind of, you know, all the things that databases give you and all that. You don't want to write that every time. No. Um, and I really can't kind of imagine any project that I've done in a long time that hasn't used about half of this stack. Um, and if you kind of fail or if you choose not to use this stack, uh, you're probably very likely to fail. So, um, open source every day. I kind of want to talk about this, this, this graph that I kind of made up. It's a, it's a rough graph. Uh, and it runs from now to a long time ago. Um, it's not really to scale. But this is my open source contributions um, over the time. And uh, GitHub kind of comes out, ar out around here, 2008. And uh, you might be wondering what this little spike is just the left of GitHub. So back in my days, how I kind of got into programming, um, 
I used to mod games a lot, so this is the release of Roller Coaster Tycoon. <laughs> Around the same time where I got my first FTP server, and I was like, friends, take! Um, not really my code to give away, but, you know. <laughs> um, but this, uh, this little block of time, is this got laser? Yeah, it does, lasers. Um, <laughs> this little block of time at the end, here, uh, represents the last 207 days. Um, it's the last 207 days that I've been giving back to open source every single day. Um, and these are the projects that I've been working on. So I've highlighted a few of them uh, in bold and white. And these are kind of the main projects that I've been working on, and I'll touch on those a little bit later on in this talk. Um, but doing open source every day is a bit crazy and difficult to find time to, and like, it's hard to find meaningful things to build. Uh, so in between, kind of all the little bits of jobs, I've been doing a lot of hardware hacking. Uh, hardware hacking is really awesome because it allows you to yield some really cool results in actually very little effort. So um, making an SMS drone, um, or an uh, MN machine wired up to GitHub, um, an internet connected rocket launcher, playing portal with a portal gun, uh, a lamp controlled through uh, SSH, because, you know, why not? High voltages are fun. Um, and hacking like a little easy button from Staples. And, you know, it's quite fun doing these things and it doesn't take a crazy long time. Um, and also building some really useless shit as well. Um, so this is uh, my, I'm a massive portal nerd. Um, and this is the personality core Euro lengthener, because the world means one of those. Um, <laughs> but the majority of this talk is kind of about this period here. Like, what the fuck happened there? Um, and we got these kind of two little hurdles. And this was around the time when I was doing no open source uh, at all. Um, and the main reason for that is this product. I was working on this product called Conduct Layer. And talking about the personal development stuff, my approach to personal development is to do everything to an extreme. Um, so I, even if I don't believe in it, like that's my way of testing my assumptions. So like if I don't believe in something, I'll go out of my way to prove it and even spend like weeks on it. But in the case of this project, it was uh, me giving up doing anything else in my spare time. I wanted to get really good at uh, Ruby on Rails and Angular. Um, so I just stopped doing anything else and banned myself from working on any other project. This didn't really work. Um, this project uh, suffered. Oh, I'm missing a GIF. I can't skip GIFs. This, uh, this, this product really suffered from a, a ship it failure. Um, you know, I, I couldn't pick. I had to have all three. I'm sorry. Um, it suffered from a ship it failure, and 18 months go by, and I've not worked on, uh, I've not worked on any other project. And I'm just feeling really demotivated, and I want to work on something else. But my rules, they say that I can't, and I have to follow the rules because I have OCD. Um, 18 months go by, and I, I'm just hate. And then one day. Uh, one day we ship a server and we need to send a password to a client via another client. Now we use like Puppet and things like that and uh, I can't just change the password for them. It breaks a whole infrastructure. So I have to send this password to a client via another client. I don't want one in the middle to know. But I don't want to use like PGP, that's like crazy over engineering. Um, so in my lunchtime I kind of thought, you know, this will take an hour. I can break my rule. It's only an hour, whatever. So um, I built Kevlar, uh, just like in an hour. And, um, and this is kind of a Snapchat, basically, for text. So um, I frame load. Here we go. So you come in here, you write your secret. I don't mean it. I'm sorry. Uh, you write your secret and you get this URL. And um, uh, if you follow through to it, uh, so you normally give that out to somebody, it gives you a warning message because I was founding crawlers were just coming in and just destroying things. You see this message and you say, um, show me the message. 
And uh, by the time that this page renders, that, that message is uh, destroyed permanently. Um, so it's a little project, it was just a bit fun, and it allowed me to kind of send somebody a pass it in a simple way. Um, and I found like 10,000 odd people started using this in the first couple of weeks. I posted that up on Hacker News and Reddit, and loads of people started using it, and I, I, I'm the only one with access to the database, so I saw it. Um, <laughs> that's a lie, I never do that. <laughs> um, and this was quite exciting, and uh, I, I, for those of you who don't know me, I run the Bristol JS group. And one day I wanted to get some ideas, some feedback, you know, what talks do people want to see? So um, I looked for like polls and things that we can kind of hold at the event. Um, so I found this thing, poll everywhere, and it looks awesome. It's like people can vote on talks, that would be amazing, except it looks like shit. Um, this, is, this is what it gave me out of the box, and this was after quite some heavy customization. It's it, no. It's just horrible. So um, I was thinking, you know, that thing that I did, that Kevlar thing, that was a bit of fun. And it's like, maybe I'll break my rule again. So I built this thing called Poll. So this was uh, just a little project built in a day. It's a real-time polling system. I will do a little demo of it because uh, it would be fun. We can hold our own little election here. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Nick said, no politics. And I was like, fuck. Um, <laughs> So, um, and loads of people started using Poll, including this person. This is the most popular one uh, I have, and it's written in Japanese. I have no idea what it means, right? <laughs> and I haven't dared Google Translate it, because I feel like I'll be really disappointed. It will be something like, who's your favorite future on my character? I don't know. Just the mystery, the shroud of mystery is the most exciting thing about this. Um, so I'll never translate it. And if you know it, please don't tell me down the path. Um, but just to kind of give you a demo of this, um, if you want to hit this URL at the top, poll.lab.io forward slash PM, uh, you can vote for who the next Prime Minister is. It's either Stephen <coughs> Fry, Jeremy Clarkson, Sue Perkins, Ruth Jones, Jeremy Paxson, Russell Brand, or Sarah Milliken. And I can get a drink. To music. <laughs> yeah. So the idea of this was we could get feedback on what talks people wanted to see in real time, and we could have conversations about them at the event. Hugely valuable for me. But I also found that loads of other people used it, and this got me really excited again. Um, Stephen Fry is. I'll give him a call tomorrow. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> What have we got? What have we got? Second part. Jeremy Paxson, and then Sue Perkins, Jeremy Perkins. Anybody wants Ruth Jones? Oh, cool, Ruth Jones. Um, this got me really excited about kind of releasing these little micro products, these things that kind of did one thing well. Uh, so I decided that I'll open source all the things, which is where the title is. Open source all the things. Um, so I'm going back through old hard drives and just trying to find all the little things that I built that I never released. Like, my blog was closed source. Why? Nobody wants to steal that. But, you know, there's no point. It was costing me money, even if it was a private repo. But, um, so I decided I'll open source everything. Um, so I'm going back through kind of my archives, and I was like, yeah, blog, that can go. Um, I built this little pusher pusher thing a while ago. I thought that can go. This is my wedding website. Anyone want to steal my wedding? Just go for it. Um, yeah, this is my wedding website. It's got like an RSVP system or whatnot. And I was like, that can be open source. People might contribute. And it actually taught me kind of to write things in a more abstract manner. Because I ended up writing code for that in a way where I wasn't making too many assumptions. I was building more like a product for somebody else. Um, it doesn't even assume that it's a man and woman getting married. You don't have a, a husband and a bride, it's just a couple. Um, so, to some extent, it made me a better programmer. Um, and little tiny tools like this. So I built this uh, debugging interface for orientation, for gyros and all that. I was like, yeah, 
domestic power. Fine. And this didn't happen immediately, but I started again becoming a little bit compulsive about it because the way that kind of my style of learning stuff is I force myself to do things because interesting things happen when you do that. So I set myself a few rules. Do something every day that is open source or will be open source. This has actually since changed. Um, this is kind of how it started. Do something every day that might be open source one day, or well, no, will be one day. Um, but I don't do that anymore. I open source everything straight away. Um, oh, no, that makes a good black. Wow. It's amazing. Um, so what I tend to do now is uh, when I start on a new project, I'll do a commit and pass in the option line blank and just push it up. And what that means is it takes away the decision of when the first bit of code can go up. So there's no point where it's like ready for people's eyes because they need to protect their eyes um, from my code. Uh, this kind of means that it goes up before any code is written. And that means I can push whatever I want, feel comfortable with that. Um, Leave it better than you found it. So the GitHub graph is bullshit. Um, that doesn't, that's not really what I'm doing it for. Uh, I think it's only valuable if you contribute something of value. Um, so you can't kind of make breaking changes. I can't make breaking changes that, you know, move me towards this other thing uh, without, at the end of the day, it being better than I found it. I always have to leave work uh, in a better place, and it forces me to break down my work into smaller, manageable chunks. Um, ship early and ship often. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but this is hugely, hugely important. Um, and if it's broken, fix it. Uh, I couldn't give you a better way to get started in contributing to open source than this. The amount of projects that I've come across where the documentation is just slightly wrong and I've kind of realized on the way, and that's a great way to get started. It's a great way to contribute back. If you come across something that's broken, just take the time to fix it. Um, and with the Conduct.io stuff, I didn't want to release that because it was never ready. It was never like pixel perfect or the API wasn't quite right and the designs or the responsiveness. And with the first version of Kevlar that I showed you, this was, uh, this was the mobile experience. But it's a damn lot better than that. Like, something that's crap and broken is a lot better than nothing at all, in my opinion. In my opinion, because not everybody agrees. But wouldn't it be boring if everybody agreed on everything? Um, not everyone agrees. People kind of say, Minimum lovable product is what I'm going to ship. I've been on both sides of the fence. I don't agree with this. I think just shipping, if it's better than it was yesterday, ship it. That's my stance on it, but take away what you will. <laughs> um, and then on day 18 <coughs> of doing open source and get pumped up by this, and I was like, that conduct IO thing. You know, I'm in a new frame of mind. I was never going to open source this anyway. But on day 18 of doing open source, I was like, yeah, oh shit, that is it is. And uh, it turns out, nobody gives a fuck. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. I don't use it. I use the other tools that I built, but I don't use this. It's not simple enough. It's, it's elegant, but, but nobody cares. Um, so I really can't emphasize how much shipping early makes sense because I wasted a year and a half of my life on this product that just is pointless. It's, it's not useful to me in any way. Um, so test your assumptions early, just ship early. Um, now, I don't normally, I've given this talk before, I don't normally do this bit. This is uh, what am I doing now? Um, but it tends to be the thing that I get asked down the pub afterwards, so if you can bear with me. Um, I'm still working on this, I'm slowly turning it into a product, but it will pro it's a product that will remain open source. Um, so hitch.it 
you know, hitch.it was actually a very specific domain name because then I can do like Adam and Keris dot hitch dot it. Genius. Um, I'm still working on this as a product because I found it immensely useful and I think other people find it useful. It allows me to work out my RSVPs and costs and it's got to-do lists with loads of default sensible things and uh, people can upload their photos afterwards. I think it's a really valuable product and it's something that I want to kind of develop a bit further. Um, this GIF has absolutely nothing to do with my talk, but I think you all agree it's awesome. <laughs> um, who here uses Alfred? Yeah? Oh really? One person? No way! Okay. Alfred is, uh, is this little baby. It kind of allows you to do like things like uh, one plus one is two. Let's uh, make that large and like gives you loads of really instant access stuff. It's a bit like a CLI, but more user friendly because it gives you feedback along the way. Um, and I've been working on a package manager for this because I use it all the time. And the package managers just suck. Um, and the last thing is Tech Talk Sire. Meetup is £16 a month and provides you pretty much nothing. Um, based on my previous experience with the Kevlar stuff and the Pulse stuff, the things that I've developed the most and cared about the most are things that I'm passionate about. Um, Meetup really pisses me off. <laughs> uh, it's got a really restrictive API. I've tried kind of building this Jekyll thing for Bristol JS, which communicates through their API and auto updates and things like that. And just, I'm just, no, it's just not working for me. Um, so I'm going to take on Meetup, because why not, and make it open source while I'm at it. Um, so this is a project that I literally only started, I don't know, 10 days ago or so. Uh, making some good progress on it. It's a fairly old screenshot, actually. Old screenshot, it's 10 days old. <laughs> um, so yeah, take on meetup with this and hopefully build something for you guys. Um, and whilst I've been doing open source, I need a beer. Hold on a sec. That's bad. Uh, whilst I've been doing open source, I've learned a bunch of stuff from it. Um, the whole point of kind of doing things to extremes is there are lessons that you can learn from it and flaws that you can learn from it to form better arguments that you wouldn't otherwise if learn if you are faster. Um, plus the OCD thing. Um, working on other people's projects exposes you to new processes and different opinions. So I used to really hate Ham. Uh, and I hated Ham because all of my like techie friends did. So therefore I did. You know, we only really hate Ham. Shit in there. Ham was fucking awesome. Um, and I wouldn't have known this. I wouldn't have known this if I didn't work on 24 Core. So one of uh, Andrew's Nesbitt's projects um, is 24 Core requests. And I was building kind of this event system into it. And I had to use Hammer because I was contributing to somebody else's ideals. Uh, and I fell in love with it. It's amazing. It just completely simplifies my code and just allows me to write stuff quicker and better. Don't be afraid to give stuff away, not everybody wants to steal your ideas. Uh, Conduct.io, it's open source, nobody's touched it. Um, whereas Poll, something that I kind of released in one day, um, like people have been contributing to it. And, and it's, it's a really good thing, I just really like it. Um, it's okay to be a generous, so this is something I added recently. Um, when I started thinking about this bit, I'm a full stack developer. Um, I'm not front end, I'm not back end or anything like that. Um, and doing open source every day has made me a little bit more comfortable with not being a specialist in any one area because it's given me experience that I wouldn't have otherwise had um, if I wasn't doing open source every day. That's been a real big benefit for <coughs> me. I have loads more time for new projects. This was a really quite surprising thing. Um, when I release my code open source, I felt less responsibility to maintain it. Um, 
if somebody wants a poll to scale to a million users in a few hours, they can go and fork it or go and contribute back to it. And I feel less responsibility to kind of maintain this thing that's perfect. Uh, and that gives me more time to do the things that I'm really interested in. Um, and this is a negative. Nothing of significance has changed. Um, so I quite like doing these experiments as kind of a way to see, you know, what happens if I do that? What happens if I do it every single day? Um, what opportunities will come up? And nothing of significance has happened. It's changed how I think about code. It's changed my process. Um, but nothing of significance. Um, and I definitely have less time for other things. It's just ridiculous trying to find time to do open source every single day. Um, because, yeah, this was me. Last weekend, on my own stag do, <laughs> I'm this twat. Um, which is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, and the first time I gave this talk, I was, I think, 42 days into doing open source every day. And I said this before, and I meant it. Um, I really mean it this time, that I quit. Like, it's been a really interesting thing to do, and I think I've become a better person for it. But it's simply not sustainable. Um, so thank God, today it ends. <laughs> um, I mean it this time. Um, it's just not sustainable, but it's been really interesting, and that's what I really like about doing things to an extreme. Interesting things happen from it. I wouldn't be still here today. Um, but there are a couple of things, finally, I want to end on, a couple of things that have been unexpected that, uh, that have come out of doing it. Uh, Carl, you're not here today, are you? All right? Okay, no mind. I warned him, I thought he might come along just to see what I was going to put up. Um, the unexpected things is when I've done this talk before, uh, Carl has released everything that he's ever done. Like, he's been going through all of his archives and just like finding little toys that he built and things like that. Um, you know, it's only one person, and I've had other people kind of say they'll do it, but, you know, I've seen one person do it, but that makes it all kind of worthwhile. Um, I got to 207 days. That was never intended. It was intended to be kind of a month or something, I don't know. Just a short little experiment. Um, but it's something that I just couldn't give up. Uh, I really struggled just to give up with it. Uh, so I'm really surprised that it's kind of carried on this long. And I really don't think that I'd get away with doing open source on my wedding day, <laughs> let alone my home. Which is in like five weeks, I don't know. Um, the event stuff that I did for 24 pull requests right early on on this process attracted loads of events, loads of events where people who had never done open source before started getting involved with open source, uh, Bristol JS included. Um, so this was kind of an unexpected thing that was really quite exciting, getting people involved again. Um, and that was built because I did the event stuff. And um, I had to blur this out, I was really hoping to give you the non-blurred version before today. Um, but I was working on this uh, dashboard, this kind of TV screen Twitter thing for our hack days. And um, it showed like recent tweets and I found a bug in Twitter. And uh, I reported that and it's got a nice $420 bounty. And it's not even closed yet, I think it's been open so long, I think they'll give me more, hopefully. Um, but that would have never happened. I would have never kind of got involved with that security kind of side of thing. And, and, you know, if I wasn't doing this open source work. In fact, the only reason it happened was I checked my API key <laughs> into an open source project. Um, and then I had to revoke that. And I'm probably giving you way too much information now. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I'll take any questions now if we've got time. I don't know. I'm not sure I'll answer it very well. I'm not rehearsal question.
Um, so, how do you go from effectively throwing code into the void to having 10,000 users suddenly using your code one day? Uh, it was actually completely unexpected. Uh, I wrote it all on the Saturday. Um, I had just a little bit of housekeeping, like half an hour or so on the Sunday, and I pushed it out and put it on Hacker News. And it was only, uh, like, I went out for a walk down in, like, down near Wookiee Hole or something, and it was only when I got back, probably around 6 o'clock in the evening, that I realized it had been on Hacker News number one spot. It was on there for 18 hours at number one. Um, which just was completely unexpected. Um, so, yeah, media, I guess, <laughs> is the answer to that. Hacker News is, can be flaky, but sometimes, you know, it was a quiet day, I guess. Um, and my friends at Pusher just like noticed it on Hacker News and just like lifted my limits, which was very nice of them. What's your favourite license? MIT. Why? Um, I think that people tend to understand it without it needing explaining, which is a nice thing anyway. There are certain licenses which I would have to look <coughs> up what they meant. So I think, in terms of accessibility, in terms of you know how you manage it is, that's a really good thing. Um, but it's also unrestricted, except for liability. Which I quite like because if you're going to give stuff away, go the whole four and ten yards and just give it away. Um, yeah, it's my personal preference. I think that for bigger projects, uh, the GMU license can be a lot better. Um, but I don't work on any of those, <laughs> really. Yes. Does it cost you a lot in hosting and stuff? Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> So it cost me a lot in hosting. Yeah, my hosting bill is about £160 a month, I think. It's, yeah, it's a bit ridiculous. So anyone wants to sponsor me, um, you know, I'm open. I'll grab you a pint later. Uh, yeah, it's a bit ridiculous. There's no pizza yet. What's going on? Am I, am I under? Yeah. Oh. Uh, what am I using to host? Um, so I tend to use Heroku where I can. Uh, actually, I say Heroku where I can. Uh, it just changed their free plan. Uh, a little bit good, a little bit bad. Um, so Heroku is quite good because it will allow for spikes, it will allow for peaks in my free plan. Um, so when you post up, you can use it. Things like my wedding website, I require dinos and workers. Heroku, in their previous plans, sorry, got ridiculously expensive. As soon as you add one little thing that costs money, it would just shoot up price wise. So anything that was expensive on Heroku, I used Doku for. Uh, so Doku is a Docker powered, self hosted Heroku. Um, and the reason I use that is, I, for these personal projects, I don't have time to manage infrastructure. Uh, and Heroku and Doku allow me just to just to deploy like <coughs> Git push um, and for something to be live because I wouldn't really achieve anything anything much. I certainly wouldn't recommend it for larger projects. Certainly, the work that we do at Simple Web, we wouldn't ever use Heroku or Doku, it just gets too expensive too quickly. Um, but where infrastructure, there isn't time for infrastructure to be managed, I highly recommend it. If you see something that needs fixing, uh, how, do you, how do you approach the kind of project maintainers and stuff to... I'd fix it and push a package. So, um, so, unless you're familiar with it, uh, GitHub has a concept of pull requests, so it's, I've made a change, I'd like to propose that change um, into your branch. Um, 
So that consists of code change, a, do, a description. So this is something a lot of people don't do. A lot of my projects, I get pull requests without any description. They've just got code. Don't do that. Um, because if I have a bit of context, then I'll spend a bit of time trying to work out what it does and, um, and whether it's valuable for the project. Um, I get a lot of code pull requests which just don't give me any description and it gets put to the back of the queue because of that. So I make sure I do code like descriptive pull requests and um, you know, depending on what the project is, uh, you, uh, hopefully they'll get merged in. Sometimes they're not the right bit of work. Sometimes that work is thrown away. It's up to the owner's discretion, really. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, do you not try to gauge at all? And, and not people so they expect your pull requests? Or? Not beforehand, no. No, I don't tend to do that. I don't think that's kind of people really expect that. I guess, I guess sometimes with things you'd raise an issue just to see, you know, if it's something that you expect the other person to be working on, it might be better practice. So the drone thing that I showed before, there was an issue with that when uh, you disconnected from the drone, you couldn't reconnect without removing the battery, things like that. And I was like, that's such an obvious issue. So I'll, I'll raise an issue for that to just check whether the person's already working on it. But normally people people have a lot of visibility of what they're doing anyway. Um, so it's not usually required. Um, one more? Yeah. Um, what's been your experience of the open source community? Like any arseholes or No, no. Um I'm a Ruby dev, so no <laughs> I've just offended two thirds of the room. Uh, I'm a Ruby dev, so like the community is really acceptant of criticism, I found. Um, and no, I, ha I haven't. I found people to be strong opinioned, but, but not harsh. Um, but I'm the same as well. I can come across a bit hostile when I really believe in something. Um, and it doesn't really surprise me when other people do. People have got strong opinions about them, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, no, I've not had any bad experiences at all. I have times where I've been disappointed that hours of work have been thrown away, but understanding. <laughs> right? Thank you very much. Cool. Okay.